So, um, as I said, it's, it's always quite difficult being the last speaker because you don't know what's going to be said before you, and difficult to know whether you're going to be repetitive or not. But uh, fortuitously, um, almost every speech has something that kind of feeds into what I'm about to talk about, of course, through my own total genius, um, rather than pure luck, so, or, cu or the curation of the event, possibly. Um, so over the last four years, um, I've been investing in something uh, we call convergence. Um, and this is the convergence of deep technology um, with a blockchain enabled infrastructure. Um, and what I'm going to propose today is that um, this potentially offers, this new infrastructure potentially offers the last chance for an equitable robot economy. Um, the premise is that um, what if we could hard code economics and potentially ethics into the fabric of the web to literally change the rules of the game to our benefit? So a few presenters already have referred to fangs, and I like to put bat fangs together because it makes it sound that much more vampirical. Um, and we know this kind of group of collective is subverting media and potentially as a consequence democracy. Um, but why is this critical when considering the robot economy? Um, well, we know that platform monopolies become data monopolies, which become AI monopolies. And I believe that this is the existential threat. Um, and we've already done a good job of this today. We expand what we mean by robots and we combine that with this AI advantage, um, this multiplies the threat. So to date, fangs have been primarily focused on harvesting um, web habits and data to serve better ads. Um, but increasingly, it's been, become focusing AI in our homes, vehicles, digital assistants, and companions. So companies, cities, governments, uh, and as a consequence, its citizens are becoming ever more reliant upon IBM Watson, Google DeepMind, um, and the Ubers of this world. Um, and that's both in terms of you know, bots, chatbots, which is the interface, uh, the new interface with the web. We're no longer gonna be uh, typing things in or touching screens. Autonomous systems, such as the smart home, the energy grid, autonomous vehicles, and then of course, adaptive manufacturing. And this touch touches pretty much every area of our life. Um, our used society um, 5.0 is a good example, um, but it's everything from industry to health. So what I propose the antidote is, um, is a combination of technologies which is often referred to as blockchain. There's actually a, um, a stack of technologies. It's a catch-all term, really. And some of the speakers have already done a good job of I'm packing that for you, but what I mean is a distributed ledger. Um, I mean digitally scarce assets, and they can be fungible or non-fungible, but these units of value within these systems that can be either currencies or digital commodities. Smart contracts that can program rules about how that value is moved around in the system. And of course, all this stuff lends itself very well to AI. So really what we're seeing um, with the emergence of this new Web3 technology stack is a shift from a decentralized, top-down, uh, mediated systems to more peer-to-peer -peer environments. And importantly, that means machine-to-machine -machine or agent-to-agent rules-based markets. Um, and what's most interesting is because of smart contracts and the fact that you can hard code um, rules and consensus mechanisms into the protocols themselves, they can be fully compliant by design. They can be auditable and, dare I say, taxable. In fact, uh, just the promise of the self-sovereignty of data, i.e. it's no longer these centralized systems that control or own our data, fundam fundamentally breaks the business model of Web2 and the platform monopolies that have coalesced around it. So, um, and the idea of tokenization, the tokenization of this new infrastructure um, through these units of value, like Bitcoin, um, promise to deconstruct the whole Silicon Valley VC model that goes with it. So I propose, and this is where we invest, um, that the web has a new business model, one that is uh, more open source, one that is tokenized, one where the value, that token and the value in it can be fractionalized, 
and uh, presents a new opportunity for crowdfunding 2.0. Crowdfunding of universal public, open public utilities. So it's these units of value or the tokens that are the killer app of blockchain. So people that contribute uh, to these systems and networks, be that capital, code, or compute power, um, receive tokens in return, this kind of crypto equity. And this makes them both contributors and users and shareholders or stakeholders. Um, and due to the inbuilt scarcity, um, founders who create these systems um, can make a return, can make a, um, a successful return on their time by the rising value of these tokens, this unit of value, and therefore they can afford to open source everything. And so as a VC in this space over the last four years, we've seen um, the majority of companies that were coming to us previously were proprietary based equity um, uh, uh, solutions um, where their end state was probably to sell to Google. Um, they're now open sourced day one. And that's all possible because of the tokenization of value in those systems. So the most powerful way to think through blockchains as this catch-all term is their power to coordinate the mass decentralization of the web, enabling a new, more equitable web infrastructure that can help technologies and their ecosystems, such as AI and robotics, scale securely, become compliant, but more importantly, better distribute the value that they create. And we call that blockchain plus. So specifically for AI, that means we can incentivize distributed networks of people or organizations, a long tail of data owners um, or developers to compete and potentially even dwarf Google. Collectively, they can contribute resources, including compute power, data, its curation and availability, algorithms, where all participants, even end users, are fairly remunerated and where power doesn't concentrate again into the hands of a few. Um, and by the way, this is a real project called Ocean Protocol, and it's based here in Europe. So like most important technical innovations, this is also a socio-economic paradigm shift, perhaps one of the greatest in our history. It literally allows for anyone, anywhere, to birth a digital economy and program it with game theory, with rules to underpin it, to incentivize and disincentivize behaviors to optimize the system. And by the way, regulators can also be a participant, a stakeholder in the system. We can literally change the rules of the web, change the rules of the game to affect a better outcome. Because what we're seeing most innovations now are starting as open source initiatives, um, what that means is they're inherently more evolutionary in nature. Um, they can be forked, so somebody can take a derivative of the Bitcoin blockchain and create their own version <coughs> with, with some tweaks. Um, therefore, it can evolve. This makes these systems much less fragile when compared to typical equity-based investments with proprietary technology, where 90% of startups fail in the first three years. So if you think about the amount of capital and IP that's developed in that way of financing innovation, when the startup fails, almost all value know-how is lost forever. So it's a really, really inefficient way to finance innovation. Here, because it's open source, if a team fail in their implementation, the code can be picked up like a relay race and moved forward by a new team as long as there's a community around it. What's more, because it's open source, it can't be bought and it can't be killed off by incumbents, which is the strategy of Web2 at the moment. Anything that comes along that looks remotely threatening, it's acquired, maybe assimilated, but largely just killed off. That is impossible with open source. So really the opportunity here is we can create new operating systems and a series of economic frameworks to build new standards for the web. Think about HTTP, SMTP, GPS. We can now have universal um, standards and systems and frameworks specifically for fields of deep technology but also universally for people and things. So that applies to IoT. I know a number of people uh, today have already mentioned that. Um, so the, this system can allow for digital economies to form around IoT and industrial IoT to allow for the affordable and secure transfer of value between machines, um, machine to machine micropayments. And by the way, that already exists. It's called IOTA and it's again here in Europe. It can allow for 
um, trusted bot marketplaces where bots have license plates, including their constituent parts, where developers can trade code as unique assets, where users can train AI in co-ops and own rights to their output. By the way, this is already in existence and it's called Seed. It's not sadly here in Europe, but it's located out, it's moved from Silicon Valley to Singapore. So Silicon Valley just lost this to Singapore. And one that doesn't exist today, but I'm very excited about, is the idea to secure 3D printing, where a CAD file can become a unique digital asset, a printer, a wallet, and all transactions recorded on a ledger. All of a sudden, you've secured and enabled the scaling of edge manufacturing. And when combined with AI, um, can allow for processes and even products to become living, evolving, self-improving things. And this hints to the convergence thesis that I mentioned earlier. So because I believe these projects and their underlying technologies um, promise to become industry standards, um, because they share common features, um, the operating systems um, have commonalities and hopefully they'll be open source, they'll be tokenized and they'll be built on distributed ledger technologies. It allows for degrees of interoperability where they can combine in interesting ways, as I alluded to earlier. Um, and this allows for this convergence of deep tech. And that promises to fast track and incentivize smart grids, connected cars, and the maker economy becoming a reality. So the ultimate example of a convergence project is one that allows for AEAs, Autonomous Economic Agents, where devices or entirely synthetic beings have agents that represent them and their interests in bottom-up markets. If we think of a world where multimodal transportation, as was mentioned earlier, could optimize itself when a drone or a vehicle and its charging infrastructure rents itself out and pays for its own insurance um, and maintenance. And by the way, this also exists and it's called Fetch.ai and it's here in Europe. So the projects that I've mentioned today are shameless examples of outliers portfolio. So I'll hold my hands up. Um, and that are pioneering convergence. But all of these things are open source, all of them are tokenized, and all of them are governed by non-profit organizations. And so I believe this is a fundamental shift in uh, deep tech and how these things are financed, and more importantly, who owns them. Um, we've just released our latest white paper, Convergence 2.0, which you can find on our website, um, which talks through these fundamental layers of protocols we believe are being built for this new emergent Web3 technology stack. From, AI, um, from IoT data collection all the way up to AEAs. In closing, specific to um, uh, members, MEPs and um, bureaucrats representing um, policymakers here in Europe, um, the reason why I wanted to do this presentation was because it's important to think about crypto beyond just a financial asset that's being speculate, speculated mm -hmm. upon as a bubble. Um, it's actually about saving the web. It's an entirely new socio-economic framework and it can allow for the safeguarding of AI. This is our opportunity to challenge Web 2.0's monopoly, both from a bottom-up perspective, but also from a top-down. Um, as you've seen, Europe has a lead, actually, in the market for convergence at the moment, and I would argue a distinct advantage. Um, none of those startups are HQ'd in the US, and there's a very good reason for that, uh, as well as a number of other regions. Um, and that's primarily because the political makeup of those regions causes conflicts around crypto. So if you think about the United States, um, they have very restrictive terms on accredited investors. You have to have at least a million dollars in the bank and a certain income to be able to invest in early stage startups. And that is obviously to preserve the status of Silicon Valley. Um, we don't have that here in Europe. Um, if you look at China, um, they want to stop capital flight. So the idea that somebody can walk across the border with a billion dollars on a USB stick is a big problem. Um, we don't have that problem here. You think of China, they have a war on cash at the moment, and that, sorry, India, they have a war on cash at the moment, and that includes digital cash. And so we're in a unique uh, situation um, whereby we can inform and be home to infrastructure and the foundations that are going to form the next phase of the web. That's it. Thank you.